Have you ever wondered how the police identify the culprit of a theft when he doesn't leave behind any fingerprints, but often leaves behind something as simple as a strand of hair? For example, imagine that the Mona Lisa has been stolen and the police have arrested several suspects. They have also found a strand of hair left behind at the crime scene. How can the police use the DNA in the follicle of the hair to identify the thief? Well, since no two people have the same DNA, the hair DNA can be used to definitively figure out who took the painting by using DNA fingerprinting through a process known as gel electrophoresis. Gel electrophoresis is the separation of DNA fragments by size. Today, we will use gel electrophoresis to match the DNA fragments in the hair to the DNA of the suspects. Here we have a gel and the gel box. The gel has a row of wells on one end where we will put the DNA samples. But how does the DNA separate? As we all learned when we were younger, opposite charges are attracted to each other. Using this principle, DNA, which is negatively charged due to the negative phosphate groups in the backbone, will be attracted towards the positive end of the box when the current runs through it. When the current is running, the DNA will separate through the gel with the smaller fragments moving faster than the larger ones, and thus moving further down the gel. But why? Let's imagine that the gel, which is made up of long intertwined chains of proteins called polymers, is like a forest with tall trees spaced apart from each other. You are carrying a 2-foot pole and your friend is carrying a 10-foot pole, and you both want to carry your respective poles from one end of the forest to the other. As you can probably guess, you will reach the other end faster than your friend because it's easier to maneuver the smaller 2-foot pole through the forest than the larger 10-foot pole. In the same way, it's easier for a smaller DNA fragment to maneuver through the gel than a larger DNA fragment. If we want to look at a diagram, it would look something like this. The y-axis is speed of movement through the gel, and the x-axis is DNA fragment size. As you can see, there is an inverse relationship between the two. One end shows that the smallest DNA fragment size moves the fastest, while the other end shows that larger DNA fragments move slower. Before we load the samples into the wells of the gel, we need to load a ladder in the first lane. The ladder is a mixture of different DNA fragments used as a standard of reference to determine the sizes of unknown fragments. The unit of measurement used to refer to the size of DNA is known as a base pair, or BP for short. Now we can take the DNA from the three suspects, mix each of them with a dye, and load them into the wells next to the ladder. Here is a closer look at how the gel is being loaded. Once we turn on the current, the DNA will start moving through the gel towards the positive end as we have explained earlier. Now we have our samples running on the gel. This process usually takes about an hour, but we have sped it up here. The individual bands of DNA cannot be seen when running the gel, but can be visualized under UV light afterward. To make sure the DNA does not run off the gel, we monitor the loading dye, shown in blue, which runs ahead of the DNA and can be seen with the naked eye. Here is an illustration of how the DNA moves when the gel is running if we could actually see what was going on. As you can see, all the DNA bands of different sizes start out clumped together at the wells and then slowly separate based on size over time. Now that our gel has finished running, we can visualize the bands in a gel imager using UV light. The gel imager is connected to a camera that then takes a picture of the gel with the DNA bands visible. These are examples of what gels visualized under UV light with a gel imager looked like. Here is our finished gel picture. As you can see, in column 1 we have the ladder. Column 2 has suspect 1's DNA, column 3 has suspect 2's, and column 4 has suspect 3's. The last column has the mystery DNA from the hair strand found at the crime scene. As we mentioned earlier, each person has a unique set of DNA. So the DNA location on the gel, or in other words, the DNA sizes, should match between the suspect who actually committed the crime and the hair's DNA. In our case, that's suspect 2. Each DNA band in the mystery DNA column appears in the same location in suspect's 2 column, indicating that the two DNA samples come from the same person. What else can we tell from the gel results? Well, remember how we said earlier that the ladder can be used to figure out the size of an unknown fragment of DNA? Let's try to do just that with suspect 2's DNA. The first fragment is at the very top of the gel and lines up with the 1000 base pair ladder marker, so we know that that fragment is around 1000 base pairs long. 
The second fragment is trickier because it doesn't line up perfectly with the ladder marker, so we need to estimate the size. Since it's between the 500 and 800 base pair markers, but closer to the 500 one, we'll say that it's approximately 550 base pairs. In the same way, we can determine that the size of the last fragment is approximately 225 base pairs long. In summary, we learned that DNA can be separated based on size using gel electrophoresis. And the results are applicable to real-world scenarios such as DNA fingerprinting to solve crimes. Mm -hmm.